Welcome to everyone that's joining us on YouTube. So Inside Arc, this is part two of the Believer's Authority. If you missed part one, please go back and check it out. You can catch it on our YouTube channel or you can see it. Actually, I think it's on the front page of our website, www.artministries.com.au or you can follow the Facebook and then you'll have things come into your news feed every week and we always upload the YouTube to the ARC Facebook. So I hope you enjoyed last week and um, love that you're joining us. Whenever you're joining us, whether you're a member of ARC or whether you're a friend of ARC in the community, we love you. We release the blessing of the Lord upon your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, just talking about one of my favorite subjects, the devil just had to, I think I had to deal with so many different um, torments and things in my life with fear that I um, had to make that a subject that I was um, comfortable with. I wasn't always comfortable with that. I actually grew up in a denomination where I never heard the devil mentioned once. I never knew anything about um, Satan whatsoever, but who knows that we are in an invisible war. And there is an enemy, whether you want to know it or you don't want to know it or whether you like talking about it or not, just because we want to be an ostrich doesn't mean that Satan doesn't know who you are. He knows who you are because you're born again. Amen? Hallelujah. So last week we spoke, to, we spoke about how the enemy takes our authority from us, that he doesn't have any authority. And he does that by sending out rogue thoughts and he deceives us. So as, as I just said to everyone watching on YouTube, if you didn't catch last week, please catch it because I went into great detail as who Satan is and who we are so that we really establish our authority, that he is a fallen angel, amen? He is not made in the God class, hallelujah. So we know that he, um, he has to convince us to give him our authority, so, Lord, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you want to set captives free. Lord, we all are captive in areas of our thinking. And, Lord, we just speak freedom here this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you are where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Bring your liberty here this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. So these rogue thoughts that he sends out are very pur purposeful. They are very much targeted to areas of our lives where he knows that there is a weakness in our lives. Generally, they're inherited weaknesses. So he will um, set us up. If In my life, I had inherited fear, weakness already in my life. So he set me up for situations where it would bring in the spirit of fear. And I had the decision... Uh, well, I had no decision when I wasn't aware of it or born again. But then once I was, I had the decision whether I accepted that or not. Amen. It's very difficult to um, be in a battle against someone that you know nothing about. It's very difficult to be in a battle where you actually think you're the problem. It's me. They've told me I've got this mental health problem. They've told me that I'm just an angry person or they've told me that I have this addiction or that I'm this or that I'm that. And we, of course, uh, just accept those things when we're not aware of the spirit realm that we live in. It just absolutely shocks me how much of the body of Christ is not aware that they are a spirit being in a spiritual war. Amen? It just does. It's just such an um, a, a important part of our salvation to understand that you were born again as a spirit man. Amen? And understanding that war that we're in. So all, all deception, you know, when he comes in through that deception, so demons talk to you through thoughts. That's how they project things. They project things onto you through thoughts. So everything generally that is deception has an element of truth so it makes it palatable it makes it you can receive it there's always something in it especially if they're accusations about ourselves telling us how weak we are what a failure we are all of those things we will quickly agree 
the wrong way with our adversary. When I have accusations in the spirit realm, if the enemy is saying to me, you are too fearful to forgive that person or you are too fearful of being out of control in that situation or you are too fearful of whatever, I will quickly agree, as it says in the word of God, with my adversary and go straight to God and say, I just repent of any fear that I've been operating or in in this area. It's very hard to fight with somebody that's not in the fight. Take yourself out of the argument. Amen? Hallelujah. Just remember that with your real fights, okay? <laughs> Just a tip. After nearly 35 years with my husband, amen. <laughs> Slow learner, but I finally got some of, the, <laughs> some of the truths. So he doesn't have authority, but he's not stupid. He doesn't have authority, Satan, but he's not stupid. And he is very, very, very persistent. Amen. He's very, very, very persistent. But the thing is, is that we have the DNA of God. So we have the nature of God and he will never be able to stand up against your faith. If you ever confront fear, it will run away because fear is fearful. But it just looks Hollywood. It just looks big. It just looks like, you know, something that's always overcoming and overpowering people. So... What we have to, we have to get to the place when we hear those accusations, and this is part two, so as, as I said, it'd be really good for you to listen to part one, but when we hear those accusations in the spirit realm, we talked a lot about that last week, example, you're a failure. So maybe there is an element of truth in there that you failed one time at doing something. You just failed one time at doing something. That does not make you a failure. So we shouldn't be just accepting everything that we're hearing the enemy say. You know, you're addicted. If you listen long enough to the enemy, he'll. who knows this is true? He started off with you're addicted, and then he's you can't live without that substance, and then he's you're a really bad person and you're very, very weak. It'll just grow and grow and grow the more we listen to those um, accusations, those rogue thoughts. Amen. Who can identify with that? You sound really quiet near this morning. Hallelujah. So what we have to realize is, is that you're not a weak person. If you have an addiction, you just have unprocessed emotions. And that was your way, your outlet, whatever. Whether it be panic attacks was mine and maybe spending money is yours. I don't know. <laughs> well, something else is yours. So I don't want to give you a list of things that we call addictions because that, what about just being addicted to being in control? That's a really bad one. Can't be out of control. So the first and foremost thing that you've got to realize in situations like this, because we all hear these accusations. It's not just me that hears them. Everyone in this room hears them. And we are all in charge of our own inner kingdom, our own inner thought life. Amen. We're all in charge of that life. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So the first and foremost thing is that your weaknesses or your strengths are none of Satan's business. Why are you discussing something with somebody that has nothing to do with you? You are bought with a price. You are owned by the Lord. Amen. When the enemy comes going, nyak, 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 you're this, you're that. What has it got? You need to say it out loud. I, I am none of your business. I don't care what, you know, what you're going through or what you feel, what when people use the word sin, separation from God, you know, whatever you think it is that you're doing in your life, it's none of Satan's business. And I also, we have to keep a central thought that when those things happen, we don't have to agree. We can change the way we think. We can have another thought. Yeah, it's hard when you've thought like that for 20 years. I, th I thought one way for 26 years when I um, found myself with those panic attacks and OCD and everything, I thought the same way. So, of course, it wasn't just going to go the first time I thought I'm going to have another thought. I just had to keep having another thought, keep having another thought, keep having another thought. Amen? Hallelujah. There's nothing more destructive to the kingdom of darkness. I can't emphasize this enough. 
than saying the opposite to the situation. So even if he's saying to you, you know, when my husband was addicted and I was already saved then, I was all those things too, but I just got saved first. But when I, but when I, I was just a little, yeah, less hard head than him, just a little bit. But five or six years into that, uh, you know, what the enemy wanted me to say was, is he's addicted? That's who he is. He comes from a long line of addiction. He's never going to break that addiction. That is who that person is. If you want to see things change in your family, say the opposite to whatever the kingdom of darkness is saying. Because the enemy will come and say, your children are always going to be this way. Your husband is always going to be this way. Your finances are always going to be this way. Your health is always going to be this way. Your emotional state is always going to be this way. But who knows, the only person that can change that is you. And the thing is, we have, we, are, we have a metron of authority in our families. If you are the only person that understands the Word of God, you're the one serving God, and maybe they know God, but they're just not familiar with the authority of God, then you have authority. You have authority in your extended family. You can even have authority even if they're close you know, bought in family, like close friends and things that come underneath your family title or whatever. And we have to get to that place where we realize that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that is the reason why we can say those things about us. We can say we are delivered. We can say we have a sound mind. I say things, I said things like this. He makes good choices good decisions. It's great to just pray, oh God, give them the encounter. Do a, I mean, I want this too. Do a, you know, Paul to, Saul to Paul, Damascus encounter, strike them down with the glory of God and shut. That's awesome. But what about practically? Start confessing practically. They make good decisions. They have a sound mind. They are not lorded over by any addiction. They rule and reign in their lives. Amen. Because when you were saved, that word saved, soteria, means freedom, means wholeness, means deliverance. It says you and your household. You and your household could partake of the same freedom. But we have to say it. We have to demand it really in our family amen but it's so tempting you know I'm not crazy it's tempting to look at the situation and say no it's hopeless it's never changing it's always going to be the same way and you know whatever whatever you know I had a girlfriend and she her husband wasn't in the Lord and he really hated me because he thought I was crazy well you get that right because I was a little bit more extra <laughs> from the time I was born again a little bit extra, and um, I was holding meetings in her house. Of course, when he wasn't home, when he was at work, we would hold ladies' meetings, and people get spirit filled. And we're just this was not in my hometown where I always did it. This is where my mum came, was living with my dad, who was working in Yapoon. So this was in that area. So we would go around to her house, and um, she believed for that husband for all those years. And I tell you what. He said, I wasn't allowed, well, we weren't, Christians weren't basically allowed in the house. He would throw them out. You know, he was pretty antichrist, like he was pretty against it. And um, he got saved after that many years. Something happened to him when he was working at the mines and um, he just rang up one day and I just, it was just incredible. And I thought, that is the faithfulness of that woman just believing and confessing that for all those years. I mean, I don't even know if I could have done it that long. I probably would have killed him. Oh, he wouldn't be alive if I had to go that long. But anyway, no, 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 I'd be faithful I'd, to the end, praise the Lord, not. <laughs> so Satan isn't made in God's class and we have to keep reminding ourselves that we are made in the class of God. We were made in his likeness and image, with his DNA, with his character, amen? Hallelujah. That he is a fallen angel, as we talked about last week. So only man carries authority upon the earth. And we know that Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample demonic things, snakes and scorpions, and to overcome, to overcome, you have the power to overcome 
all the power, all, A-L-L, because we always think, but I have this strange addiction or I have this strange disease or I have a, I have a difficult husband. <laughs> Meet my husband. You ain't missing difficult, hallelujah. I have something, you know, my children are worse than anyone else's children. Guess what? No, they're not. Amen. Hallelujah. So to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. So he's really skilled at deceiving mankind. That's the thing. He's been doing this for thousands of years. We've only been here for, if we have a long life, 120 years or less. Amen. So we're not so skilled. And a lot of us, we're plowing cement because we're the first person in our family to break it, to break the generational curses, to stand on the word of God, to, to command things to be shifted in our families. Amen. So it's always going to take a lot longer. You know, we look at some of the families, some of the well-known people, you know, and we think, oh, they're fifth generation pastors or they're sixth generation. I don't mean just pastors. I mean, knowing the word of God. Wow. That makes a lot of difference. When you're the first one to stand up against the enemy and say, leave my family alone, amen, and command him to go. And it takes some guts, hallelujah. So we know that Jesus came as a a man. I want to talk a little bit more today about um, some of those things I talked about last week. Some of them I didn't, but I want to talk a little bit more about the power of sin and death and what we're being set free from. And what we have the power to do. So we know that the first time that sin and death was accepted in a man, it was Adam. And it was an act of treason. And the second time, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is the second Adam. It was an act of love. So he took that curse of sin and death. Galatians 3.3 tells us that in his own body. So what was that curse? If you look at Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14 is the blessings. We all know the blessing. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. Blessed is the fruit of my womb. Blessed are my baskets. Blessed in the field. Blessed, blah, blah, blah. Blessed, 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 blessed. But not many people are going to do some light reading. Reading verse 14 to 68. Whoa. They are the curses. Let me just read a couple of these curses and see if they sound familiar. Your life shall bring, hang in doubt day and night. You shall be worried and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, I wish that it was evening. In the evening you shall say, I wish that it was morning. Because of the anxiety and the dread of your minds and hearts and the sights which you shall see with your own eyes. And the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships by the way about which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be sold to your enemies and be in bondage. They're the things, captivity, bondage, fear, anxiety, dread. And it's filled the earth at the moment, hasn't it? Because so much is going on and there's such, such an, un, um, you know, there's such an insecurity about what's happening. That's why we have to really rise up as the ecclesia and realize we are going to rule and reign, amen, in the midst of our enemies. And we're not going to have perfect governments or economies or people ruling in our nations or whatever it is that we think that we need to have to have a perfect life. Amen. What we need is that last song. We need Jesus. We need more of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he, because Jesus bore the curse in his body, we can confidently, why can we say Romans 6, 14, where we talk about, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We can say that because that curse, the curse, the law was the curse of sin and death was carried in Jesus' body. So before Jesus came, you were subject that those cursings and blessings said, if you follow the commandments of the Lord, all these blessings will overtake you. And if you don't, all these curses will overtake you. Until we came into grace And we were allowed to make mistakes. And everyone said, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
because we all make lots of them. (laughs) We're no longer under the law of sin and death. You might think something has power over you, but that is the smokescreen of the devil. It is such a lie. He does not have power over you. Amen. We're not under the law of sin and death, but we're under the spirit of life, as it says in Romans 8, 2, of Christ Jesus. We're now under the spirit of life. So we were once captive to the law of sin and death. We couldn't think outside of that law. You didn't have a power to overcome addiction. You didn't have a power. You didn't have the power to forgive. You didn't have the power to stay out of offense. You didn't have the power to manage your inner thought life and not want to kill every person on the road. (laughs) If you're a road rager, just saying, praise the Lord. Just chuck that in there for the road ragers this morning. So there was a time when we were completely trapped in sin and death. We were completely trapped by our own thoughts. Isn't that terrible? I I don't know. I think the devil just must be so shocked when he initially deceived man. Because when he looks at man, he looks at Jesus. He looks at the anointed one. He looks at the cross of Calvary. He sees into eternity what his destination is, amen. He looks at man as powerful and mighty. So that I believe the first time, which was in the garden, the first time he got man to um, be deceived was when he said to them, come on now, let's eat of the tree. So they didn't just disobey God, they obeyed Satan. That's what we do. And fell into agreement with that and gave it the power that it needed to launch that Adamic bloodline. And every one of us was born under the Adamic bloodline. Until we made the decision to come out of the law of sin and death. Amen. He provided that at the cross. On the third day, didn't he? He went, he went three days into hell. He took the keys of death and hell, amen. He took the keys that, that death and sin had over our lives. We were once captive to that. You know, dead men aren't under the law. That's what the Word of God says. It says you're no longer, uh, longer under the law if you die. So if we keep bringing ourselves under the law in areas of our life, then we know we're not dead in that area. And that's not for us to try and kill ourselves off. You will exhaust yourself out. That's for us to have the knowledge that it already says 47 times in the book of Romans, you're dead, 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 dead. And you just keep saying it until you actually receive it. And the word becomes flesh. Everyone with me? Hallelujah. So there was a time when we didn't know Jesus and we were completely trapped in sin and death. Who remembers that? I do. I really remember that time. Amen. Hallelujah. And I don't want to go back there. There was no way out for us, even if we wanted to do what's right. Remember what Paul said, because of this Adamic bloodline, Paul said it like this. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, in his spirit man, which our spirit man's unto the Lord. This is happening in our soul. But I will see another law at work in me, waging war against my mind. Amen. And making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me, in that soulish realm. And then he said, he goes on to say, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. Amen. Through that delivery out of the law of sin and death, we have the ability to speak into any situation life. We come under now the spirit of life through the grace of God in Christ Jesus. You can speak life. That means you can speak life to your family. You can speak life to your finances. You can speak life. Amen. You have that authority. And no one else can manage your inner world but you. I can't manage it. I can only give you tips and I can just tell you all the things I did wrong. And you can glean from that and laugh at me. But I can't manage your inner life. 
praise the Lord. Oh, sometimes I wish someone would manage mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus carried the law of sin and death in his body to make us free from sin, which took away the dominion of death. Because what does it say in Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So it's not talking about you swearing or you, you know, screaming at something. Like that's not sin. That's not what we're talking about. And I'm not saying big swear it up today. I'm not saying that either. But I am saying that sin is really missing the mark, going away from the path of righteousness. Really, that doesn't mean you're not in right standing with God. You can never disqualify yourself but you can separate yourself you can separate yourself from God amen hallelujah so what does it mean that you know it doesn't mean when we say we're delivered from sin from the dominion of sin it doesn't say you can't it's a choice if you want to you can because that's the choice that we have hate that. Just make me a robot right now. Because the Word of God says that we, you know, we were a sinner, but we were saved by grace. You are not a sinner any longer. You were saved by grace. I know that rocks the sacred cows and the religious demons, but that's who you are. And until we have that mindset of righteousness, consciousness, if we're always sin consciousness, we will keep bringing ourselves back under the law of sin and death. And when you're under that law, you have no authority. You have authority in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Once you bring yourself back on, you know the biggest thing you can do? You have something going down in your life. You know it's not right, wrong behavior, addiction, what anger, whatever it is. And as soon as it happens, you go, oh, isolate. Just what we all want to do. Cut everyone off. Not talking to anyone. Um, inward, you know, become really analytical about yourself. That is not the time to go on, to analyze yourself. That is the time that you say, I am the righteousness of God. And my sin, my shortfalls, my weaknesses have nothing to do with you, Satan, whatsoever. That is not the time that you separate from God. That is the time that you run. It's really strange. All through worship, I felt the Lord was saying, run into God, run into God, run into God. As a corporate word for all of us, run into God, run into God. He is a high tower to the righteous. Amen. In a time of trouble. Hallelujah. So you are not, you were a sinner but you were saved by grace. It doesn't mean you can't sin. You can sin if you want to. You can do whatever you want to do. That's the freedom of God. Amen. The freedom is that you came out from the law of sin and death where you were enslaved, where you were entrapped in that old curse and there was nothing you could do about it. But now you have freedom to make the decision. But my advice to you is stand in your righteousness. I don't care on your worst day, confess I'm the righteousness of God. Nothing, nothing boils the devil over more. Do the biggest sin in your whole life and then just say, I'm free from that. I'm free from that. That's between me and God anyway. I don't know why you're coming and asking because I'm not talking to you. You don't have to answer to the devil. God is never, ever going to come around your ears with condemnation and guilt because he said in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation or guilt for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, what did that mean? That meant those that are in the spirit of life, those that have come, been delivered from the law, the curse of sin and death, are now ruling and reigning in life, the Word of God says. But you have to believe it. You know, you know the cycle of addiction. I've taught on addiction years ago when I was doing breaking bondages. I had studied on that cycle of addiction for months because I had so much addiction in my own family. Part of it is to feel guilty and condemned and then you go right back and do it to get through it. 
and you feel guilty. So break it. I say to people that are living in those kinds of, you know, cycles that are hurting them and they're just, they are hurting them. They might not be hurting everyone around them, but they're hurting them. And and God just loves them. He wants all of us to be free. We weren't called to be oppressed by anything. We weren't called to be enslaved. We are overcomers, amen. He's given us the ability to overcome and to speak to mountains and to move things, amen, in the spirit realm. But we have to believe it and want to do it even. And sometimes you just don't even know how. Just like, Lord, I want to do that. Help me. If you call on God, he will always answer you. Amen. Hallelujah. So before we're a new creation, we had an old spirit man that was filled with anger, filled with fear, filled with bitterness, filled with hatred. We couldn't do it. Do you actually remember how bad you were? I was really bad. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We we don't want to remember too long, especially the spouses. Don't want to remember too long how bad we were. We were under the dominion of sin and death. We had no choice. You know, we might have said in our minds every day, today I'm going to be nice to people. And by about lunchtime, we probably killed about 10 people. (laughs) If we didn't say it with our words, we thought it in our, our inner thought life. Amen. You can't do it without God. Amen. So it's not a matter of positive thinking. It's not a matter of positive affirmations. That's great. And that is very biblical. But it's more than that. Amen. So when we were born again, God didn't just forgive our sin. He changed our nature. You don't have a nature to sin. There's something in every born again believer that wants to do the right thing. Do we all the time? No, because we're human and we're not Jesus. Amen. But you no longer have a sin nature. He didn't just say all your sins are forgiven. He gave, he recreated you. Amen. From the inside out. And he said, you have the DNA of God. You have the nature of God. So you're able to stand against anything that is trying to tell you. What are you standing against? You're not standing against necessarily the whole of hell or Satan with a pitchfork or whatever. You're standing against those rogue thoughts that tell you you can't do this. That tell you you're not who God says you are. And your family's never going to be who God says they're going to be. Amen. That's what you're standing against. It's no longer our nature to sin, but if we want to, you're free. That's the thing about grace. You're free. You're free to sin if you want it. And if you don't want to, you have the power to overcome it. But it no longer has power over you. Hallelujah. Amen. I know people don't always like talking about this. Some people say, I don't, that's so much work. I don't want to discipline my thoughts. I don't want to watch what I say out of my mouth. Well, cool. You don't have to. Like you really don't have to. But I would just say it would behoove you. It would be good for you to do it. Amen. It would be good for me if I did it more. Hallelujah. (laughs) My job is to set captives free. I can only tell you about the road to freedom, the revelation that the Lord's shown me and continues to show me in this area. The kingdom within you will eventually become the kingdom around you. That's why you must manage your thoughts. You must manage your thought life. Because if you are controlling on the inside, you have a fear of being out of control like I did. On the inside, eventually you will try and control everybody and everything on the outside of your world. And it will affect your whole world. Because you're trying to get peace in a way that you can't get peace. You're trying to bring peace back into a situation where it's absolutely impossible to bring peace. Where would it start that you would have peace? Where's the kingdom of God? On the inside. On the inside of man. And that's where we have to always be looking at that inner thought life. The kingdom within you will eventually become the kingdom around you. You know, the thing is about fear, what you fear the most generally comes upon you. When you haven't dealt with the fear of being out of control on the inside of you, 
it control, you will be totally out of control, totally out of control. And you will not be able to control. You, we can only as humans control to a certain extent, can't we? We can't control other people. We can't control si some situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in, amen? So we're all responsible. I'm not responsible for your inner thought life. My husband's not responsible for my inner thought life. I like to blame him sometimes, but no, I can't because it's actually me that has to do that work. It's me that has to go through that process. So how do we, I want to finish with this and talk just these few minutes before we end. So how do we fall into agreement with the devil? I really want, I felt like the Lord gave me this in the middle of the night and wanted me to share this. So is everyone okay if I keep speaking? Amen. So, well, if you're not, chuck tomatoes. <laughs> Hope no one's got tomatoes. Hayden's chucking tomatoes at me. That's really rude. So how do we fall into agreement with the devil? We've talked about how he speaks to us. He projects thoughts onto us, rogue thoughts that are his, his desire targeted, strategically targeted to bring us down. You know, and he, he knows. It could be for us as if we're leaders in ministry or if we're, um, you know, do, stepping out and doing something for God. He knows what area, he knows the buttons to push. Don't you say that about your family? Your family. No one does me like my family. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Holy. Only your family knows how to push those buttons. But not Sarah. Sarah's going, I'm an angel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I had all my Dixie chicks with me yesterday. That was very beautiful. Sarah did an event. I was so proud of her. It was an absolutely stunning. And I said to Pastor Mandy, that was me doing what she's doing. And Gabrielle was the, like the host, you know, the games person, the host person. And that's what um, Pastor Mandy would have done. So it was like passing the little baton along. It was cute. No, we don't want it back. You did such an amazing job. We're not taking that baton back. Hallelujah. I can't wait to share some of those photos. They're absolutely stunning. So what happens to us? How do we fall into agreement with these thoughts? So we know how to not fall into agreement with them is more what I'm saying. So these thoughts, for them to stick, they have to be agreed on on some level, which we've discussed over and over, and we agree with that. There are a couple of keys here. Firstly, a decision to receive that or not. So where is that decision made? So decisions can't be made in your mind. Why can't you make a decision in your mind? If you make a decision in your mind, you will reason yourself out of it by the next day. This is someone making a decision in their mind. I'll see how I feel tomorrow if I'm coming to that lunch or not rather than saying, I will be at that lunch. If you make a decision, it will be very, very shaky. Amen. Satan's not after you. He he's obviously wants to torment the soul, but he's always after the area where we make decisions. Decisions are not made in your emotions. My gosh. Are you serious? Yeah, right. I would be on a big roller coaster. I could hate you one day, love you the next. Hate myself one day, love me the next, whatever. So that's not where he's after. But decisions are made in your will. Notice that person said, I will be at that lunch tomorrow. Well, they, you know, 58 things may come against them, but I bet they're going to get there. By the person that says, we'll just see how I feel. I'm going to wake up and just, well, you're as good as done as a dinner. Amen. Because Satan knows exactly that you're floundering in that area of, I'm just going to, you know, we're never going to wake up and have everything fall into our lap or fall in line the way we want it to in life. We have to make decisions with our will. To see freedom from captivity, we have, you know, to see freedom from this captivity, we have to make the decision in our will the opposite to those rogue thoughts. I will not come under this depression. I will not listen to this lie about this accusation and this lie about my life, whatever it is. When those rogue thoughts come, if your emotion, this is so important, 
if you've never done any work like healing rooms, and I'm not saying you have to come to a healing room, but if you've never done inner healing, if you've never sought the Lord for your inner life, when things come, those rogue thoughts come, guess who's stronger? Guess who's stronger? I'll tell you now, your mind is stronger. I could talk myself out of something or into something. My mind is so powerful. We have the most, our minds are so scientifically powerful and created of God to be like that. My emotions, if your emotions and your mind are ruling the roost, your will doesn't even get a look in. Because you haven't dealt with those things when there's hurt, when there's trauma, when there's disappointment, when there's betrayals and really scarring things that happen to every single person on the earth. We all have the opportunity to either come to God ourselves, go to healing rooms, go to a counsellor, get help from, you know, seasoned prayers in that area, whatever it is, if it's, you know, between you and God or with other people, often it does take, um, there's, safety in a multitude of counselors sometimes it does take a group of people but we make decisions in our will but when our will is not ruling in our soul but our mind our reasoning your mind is your reasoning or your emotions are the ruler of your life you make bad decisions (laughs) you think about making decisions with your emotions holy or you make decisions with your reasoning I could think of a hundred reasons why Satan was right when he was attacking me constantly. I could always think of ways to side with him. Why? Because that part of my soul was so strong. Because I had lived emotionally. I had lived out of my emotions. Is this too deep? Because this will set you free. I had lived out of my emotions. I had lived out of my reasoning for my whole life. So it was, it's so foreign to us when we become Christians to take responsibility. And we don't like it. And that's that part of when Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But now I'm grown up, I'm going to act like a man. Amen? And I believe that that's facing some of the things in our lives. It's not always fun, guys. Hello? Your emotions and your reasoning will always side with Satan. Always. It's your will. You make a decision. I am the righteousness of God. I am an overcomer. Sin has no dominion over me. You can't make those decisions in your emotions and your mind, in your soulish realm. And that's where. So, what does that mean? When rogue thoughts are attacking your mind, You use your will to agree with God. Just the way Satan's trying to get you. First of all, he never, he hardly ever gets someone in their will first time. He doesn't. You think about his attacking. It comes with reasoning. Well, I guess my mother was like that. And yes, I can see that. And I do feel really depressed today. I know that's probably what's wrong with me. Whatever, whatever. It starts in that emotional realm. It starts in that reasoning realm. And then he get, wants to just take over, even though your will is trying to line up with the power of God, trying to line up with the word of God. It's probably like, pick me, pick me. Me. but you keep picking the wrong one hallelujah because he's so relentless he just goes and goes and goes until you hand your will over because once your will is handed over in a situation you're as good as giving him your life scary but it's true you're as good as giving him your authority to be exercised through you so just a little tiny little bit more. When I was having panic attacks, there came a time, a few years into it, told you I was hard head, a few years into it of trying to work it out myself, then I made this decision. I don't care what Satan says to me. I don't, because you know, with panic attacks, the threat is your fear of being out of control and you're going to die. So I basically said, I don't care what you do, you cannot threaten me with heaven. I don't care if I die. I'm going to die believing God. I actually said, I don't care 
try and kill me, do whatever you want to do, but I am believing God. I am going to die believing God. I haven't come this far. I was working on it for all that time. Remember I told you I said 50 scriptures a day, three times a day for two years. That's how come I know the Word of God. Not because I'm some fantastic brain, (laughs) because I was such a mess that I had to know the Word of God. I made that decision. How did I do that? Well, my lie was, I'm going to kill you through a panic attack. Sure did feel like it, guys. Sure did feel like it. Who knows when those things push on your emotions, it changes physiologically the hormones in your body, the chemicals in your body. That's how we end up sick. That's how we end up depressed. That's how we end up full of anxiety and fear. So... Why? Because we think about those rogue rogue thoughts long enough and our body starts to respond to it. The adrenaline starts to be released. If you've ever been through adrenaline burnout, which I have a couple of times, you know what that feels like? Because those things are relentless and they will do that to us, amen. I had major roots of fear in my soul, obviously, a fear of being out of control and a fear of death. They were the two roots that I had to deal with. My decision I made in my will was, if I die, I'm going to heaven. Satan, you are not threatening me with heaven any longer. I don't care. Did the panic attack stop right away? No, but immediately I gained authority. So the only way I can describe it. Did the panic attack stop? No, but I actually knew somehow through that decision in my will, it com- that one decision completely turned the rudder out of, of a very big ship that was on the road to destruction. That one decision, when we talk about decisions in our lives. His stronghold over my mind, you know, was weakened through that one decision. It was weakened. And when I started to act on the Word of God and believe the Word of God. There was an authority there that was never there before. Why? Because He had my will. God can do nothing apart from your will. He had me, lock, stock and barrel, because I did not understand the invisible war that we live in. Amen. I still had to manage my inner thought life and allow the Lord to transform my mind with word, with the Word of God and with count, encounters of His love and encounters of God, of course. But all change starts with one decision in our will. One decision. Some of you may feel like your situation is so hopeless that that just sounds ridiculous. How could one decision... And you may not, and some people won't make a decision because they're, fear of, they're fearful of failing. If you make the decision, I can 100% back it up. Not that you won't have panic attacks. Not that you might not have thoughts of doing whatever you're trying to stand against or thoughts happening that you don't want to happen. But you will have an authority that you haven't had before. Because you made that decision. Thank you everyone for joining with us today. We're so glad. I nearly left without saying goodbye to you. Sorry about that, guys. (laughs) Whenever you're watching this, I believe that the power of God to break the yoke and destroy whatever's been, that anointing will destroy whatever's been lording over your life in Jesus' name.